Hi, everyone. I'll try that again. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Welcome, dear friends. You know, you've heard me say it before, I'll say it again. But turning up on Purim or turning up on Pesach and expecting to get something out of the holiday is just too late. By coming here this evening, watching online, you're preparing yourselves so that the experience of the Pesach Seder will be so much more meaningful. And my friends, 3,334 years ago, almost to the day, your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather and your great-great-great-great-great-grandmother left Egypt. And they left behind family who just didn't want to go. But your ancestors and mine made it out. And by the way, even if you're a Ger or Gioret, we consider to be part of our people because your neshama was with those original people that left Mitzrayim. So what exactly are we celebrating? That's it. Because we left Egypt thousands of years ago. That's the celebration. And when I was a kid, I used to think that this entire Pesach Seder was a night of education. That was it. An evening, we would learn something, and the rest of the year, forget about it. I wish it were that simple. It can't just be one night of education, can it? Because if it is, I'm wasting a lot of money on yeshiva tuition when I could actually just condense all of it into one big evening of the Pesach Seder. My friends, the educational part of the Pesach Seder is actually a very, very small part. There's something much bigger and much more important. And that's what I want to talk to you for a few minutes this evening. And God willing, you'll be able to share these ideas at your own Pesach Seder. So what is this night all about? Well, about three hours ago, I picked up my daughter, who just flew back from Poland. She's studying in Israel for the year. They had a trip that was planned for hundreds and hundreds of young women. And the vast majority pulled out because of the situation in Europe, I understand. The parents are very nervous. Me and my wife said, no, you're going. And she actually wanted to go. So she spent one week in Lithuania and in Poland, and she flew back via Paris, and she landed a day with no sleep, eating tuna fish on crackers for about a week, she said to me. And we were driving back together, and I said, my wife and I and my daughter, and I said, tell me, what was the most impactful time in Poland? You've never been before. I'd led many trips. And I said, was it Auschwitz? And she's like, no, I mean, that was very sad and, and very informative, but actually not. I said, was it Treblinka? She goes, no. One of the synagogues, one of the many, many cemeteries they took them to on this trip. And she was like, no. I said, what was it? She says, it was Majdanek. We were walking through this camp, which, by the way, if you haven't been, literally is completely intact. Ashes has been broken down. Teresa's dad broken down. Treblinka broken down. Majdanek, they could turn on the lights tomorrow and turn that big switch on back in production. And if you get to the end of Majdanek, if you can handle it that far, there is, and this is the actual description of what is there, an area which is pretty much the size of this entire room. And it's circular. And it is filled with ashes. An outdoor arena that is just full of ashes. Stacked up high. How many people are inside? And if you're asking the experts, they don't even know. They can only hazard a guess from from a few thousand to tens of thousands, if not more. And I said, well, what was it like? Were you upset, depressed? And she's like, no, I was upset and depressed in Treblinka. And I was upset and depressed in my darling, my daughter Chaviva said to me. But she said, when I was standing there, look at those ashes. I felt appreciation. I said, appreciation? For what? 
and she said that I was standing here alive identifying as a live Jew and these people were not and who knows about their descendants and a little light bulb went off in my head you know what the Pesach Seder is? It's not a night of education, my friends. It's a night of appreciation. That we, somehow, miraculously, have survived thousands of years. That we're able to sit relatively safe at our Pesach Seder table and turn around and say, we made it this far. Our families still identify as Jews. We don't know which one of the four children, four sons, we actually represent. Whether it's the Chacham, the Rasha, the Tam, and the Elishol. I don't know which one we are, but at least we made it to this table and most Jews, for whatever reason, may not be sitting at a Pesach Seder that particular night. A night of appreciation, not of education. You know, everyone talks about the matzah, which is very important. It is the mitzvah doraita of the Pesach Seder, one of the two mitzvah doraitas. And many people talk about the maror, which we have so beautifully, and the afikomen, and the dal kosot, the four cups of wine, which we may mention. But we actually never seem to talk about a very small part of the Pesach Seder, which has its own name and appears very early on in the Pesach Seder, but we kind of skip over it. I could say you almost pass over it a little bit too quickly. And that is the Karpas. The Karpas. What is this very unusual food that we eat? Some people eat potatoes. Many Ashkenazim do that because, because my wife, that's all they had. Or maybe a piece of onion. Many people will eat celery, actually. I believe in Persian, karpas is related to the word karafs, which is celery. That's probably the right vegetable to eat. There you go. Now you definitely have something to share at your Pesach set of table. Karpas, karafs. But what is it? What are we doing? And by the way, we just make kiddush. Usually you wash your hands, and then we make a mozi and eat a nice big loaf of bread. And now, psych, wash your hands, don't make a bracha, and here's a little vegetable that comes out on the plate, and you're going to dip it into the salt water. Not too much. You've got a big meal coming in about two hours. Don't overdo it. And everyone's sneaking another stalk of celery and another potato, and even a raw onion was so hungry, biting into it. So what exactly is this little vegetable doing at our Pesach Seder? My friends, everything you need to know about Pesach is found in the Karpas. It's the secret to everything. Pesach, Chametz, Matzah, you name it, it's in that one small curious object that finds its way on to the Pesach Seder table. What does what karpas even mean? Very unusual word. Well, actually, you all heard this word less than a month ago in Megillat Esther because we know that the palace of Achashverosh was decorated, beautifully decorated. There was Chor, there was Karpas, and there was Techelet. Chor, beautiful colors. Techelet, blue colors, tapestries. So what exactly is Karpas? And where do we see it? So Rashi tells us the word Karpas actually is related to what Yosef Hatzadik was wearing. We remember the story of Yosef. Joseph. He was taken by his brothers who were jealous of him. Some say they felt threatened by him. And they sold him as a slave. Where did he end up? Mitzrayim, Egypt. That was his destination. 
He was the first one to make it boop, into Egypt. After that came his brothers and eventually the entire Jewish people. And then we left in the Jewish year 2448. He was the first one. We know that his father, Yaakov, gave him a beautiful coat that was katonet. Pasim katonet means a tunic, a coat. Katonet tunic. Kind of works, yeah? What's pasim? Some people say it was striped. Some people say it was very colorful. I think that's the shot of Andrew Lloyd Webber. But actually, says Rashi, it means wool. It was a wool garment. What exactly is Yosef's coat doing at the Pesach Seder? And why isn't it wool? Why is it a vegetable? Let's have a look for just a few minutes at Yosef. Because Yosef not only was an extremely important person in Egypt, into the lead up to the slavery that our ancestors went into, we're going to learn such an important lesson from him. The lesson that kept the Jewish people sane and normal for 210 years. It had to start with him. Put yourself in Yosef's position. There you are, the son of Yaakov and Rachel, the favored son, the treasured son. Maybe, say Chazal, they put too much emphasis on him. And they built up jealousy, a possible potential mistake that could have been made. And he was given this beautiful coat, everything was going perfectly. He was very, very good looking. Actually, Chazal tell us he was the most good look, one of the most handsomest men in Jewish history. Women used to jump onto a wall to catch a glimpse of him. Just to catch a glimpse. Ben Prat Yosef, Ben Prat Alei Ayin. Yosef was above the eye. He was careful what he looked at, but everyone looked at him. He was rich, he was famous, and everything was fantastic. And then his brothers did this to him. They ripped off his coat, and they dipped it in blood, and presented it to the father, and he ended up spending years rotting in a jail for doing absolutely nothing. We know what happened. We read the story. He eventually gets taken out. He's freed. He rises up because of his tremendous financial prowess. And he ends up becoming the second most powerful person in Egypt, if not the entire world. His brothers come down. At that moment, he could crush them. They have nothing. They're starving hungry. There's a famine in Israel. They schlub down to Egypt. As far as they're concerned, it's all over. And what does he do? He says, ah, don't worry about it. It's me, Yosef. By the way, how's my father doing? Right? Does he take revenge? No. Does he bear a grudge? No, the brothers were nervous that he would. They thought once Yaakov dies, it's open season. He's going to come after us. He's like, no, no, no. Don't you understand? Everything I went through, the years in jail that I suffered, was because God needed it that way. I needed to set up the land for you guys and for your children and your children's children until we leave Egypt because we're going to get out eventually and we're going to get to Har Sinai to receive the Torah. Yosef is the paradigm of acceptance. Don't look at the surface. You've got to dig a little bit deeper. And so we take that wool. You can't need a wool coat. It doesn't taste so good. And so we take a root vegetable, a root vegetable, and we dip it in salt water because right now it's bitter. But don't worry, in a few minutes, we're going to celebrate with matzah and four cups of wine and everything's going to be amazing. And that is the secret that kept our ancestors going for hundreds of years. They said, if Yosef can do it and not bear a grudge and take it out against God, then we can get through hard times as well. That is the secret of the carpath. Why root vegetable? Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? Because you look at the root vegetable and it looks like a weed. The celery top, or the carrot top, or the potato, or the onion. And it just looks nothing. Dirt with a, a few leaves on top. But once you dig into the soil, 
you see the fruit, you see the vegetable, it all makes sense. That, my friends, is the secret of Karpas. You cannot get through the rest of the Pesach Seder because the Jews could not get through hundreds of years of Jewish slavery, of torment, without realizing the secret of appreciation. And that's what Yosef represents. You know, I just had a beautiful story talking of appreciation on the drive down, I was into a shiur, and the speaker was mentioning a Haggadah that came out of Rav Chaim Kevinevsky. Zecha Tzadik Levracha, who just passed. Zecha Tzadik Levracha. Kadosh Levracha. And there's a story in this book that he quoted. I haven't read the book yet. I have like 45 Haggadot to get through. When I was a kid, we had one Haggadah. Now there's 45 of them, if not more, to choose from. He told a beautiful story. Rav Chaim Kamenevsky used to be very makpid, very careful, when it came to Lel Pesach to clean the house of all chametz, to really hunt for the chametz the night before Pesach. And he really would work very, very hard. Now, nowadays, I don't know if we're so careful, I always say that if I find any chametz in my house the night before Pesach, my wife will get so angry, it wouldn't be worth finding it. Just be mevatel it. Because by then, in most of our houses, it's all gone. Because of 30 days of preparation. But really, that bidika that we do is a real bidika. You may be looking for chametz in all the places where chametz could have been. And so he was doing his thorough check, and he used to really go overboard, spend like till the wee hours of the morning looking for chametz. So one day, his one Pesach, Erev Pesach, his grandson who joined him, and Rav Chaim pulled out the drawer and emptied out all the contents of the drawer in the kitchen. Because bread could fall in. You open a drawer, eating a sandwich. And he takes it all out, puts it on the table. And he's looking, looking, looking. And his grandson says to him, Saba, whatever he called him, can I help clean for, for, for Pesach? And he said, of course you can. I want you to put all this cutlery and all this stuff neatly back in the drawer. Stuff that doesn't like a mess in the kitchen. So put everything back in nice, tidy fashion. And he could see that his grandson was upset because <laughs> who wants to do that? You want to look for chametz, that big search and hunt for the chametz. And this kid was being deprived of it. And he saw that his grandson was upset. And he said, you know something, I'll tell you something very interesting. You know, this search for chametz is probably the Rabbanan because we actually get rid of chametz with the bitul, with the nullification, with the words we say, that we nullify the chametz. That's how we pretty much do it nowadays. But we do look for chametz because it's a good thing to do. But making other people happy, especially the mother or grandmother of the house who's preparing for Pesach, is a mitzvah do'oraita from the Torah, not the Rabbanan. Oviyahafta lerecha kamocha. So I'm just doing a mitzvah, the rabbanan, a rabbinic mitzvah. But by you putting the stuff back inside, you're doing one of the greatest Torah mitzvot. What a flip. What a different way of looking at a simple thing like looking for chametz in your house. One of the great features which everyone gets excited about, I always did, was the arrival of Eliyahu Hanavi at our Pesach Seder. Everyone knows there's a certain moment when the father or someone in the family jumps up, goes to the front door, and there's like this anticipation and a little fear that a ghost is going to come into the house. You know that feeling? Just a couple of very quiet moments where something bad's going to happen. If I was a young person, I personally would leave the house, put on a white sheet, and walk into that moment. But I'm not that kind of person. I'm not suggesting you do it, but if you do, that would be great. That's how to keep the kids awake on Pesach Seder. What's he doing there? 
Why is he Eliyahu Navi? I'm a Pesach said. As far as I remember, Eliyahu Navi is not one of the seven Ushpizin who comes to my sukkah. He's not right, no. He's not coming in on Purim. Not coming in Shavuot. Not coming to, what's he being invited? I got enough guests, Baruch Hashem. I do a big communal seder. So what exactly is he doing being invited? Why so late? If you're going to invite him, invite him in the beginning. Invite him for Kiddush, Orchat, Karpat, Yachat. And there he is, walking in already halfway through. Hey, bring him in. Open the door. What's Elio Anavi doing there? There's many, many answers to this question. And you can think of your own answers. But you have to understand who Elio Anavi is in order to answer the question. I'd like to share a possible, fascinating answer. And it goes like this. And it's pretty simple. We know that the prophet Malachi, the last prophet, the one we just read this past Shabbat, Shabbat HaGadol, Malachi the prophet says that before, right before, the day before Mashiach comes, Eliyahu Navi is going to come and announce the arrival of Mashiach. Lifne bo hayom HaGadol vanoraze. The day before, Eliyahu Navi is going to come. He's going to announce the arrival of Mashiach. So it makes sense. We know that we are still in Galut. That redemption from Egypt, that Geula, was one. But there'll be many more exiles that our people would be in. And so we welcome Elio into our homes and we're like, look, we are celebrating the redemption from its riot. Could you do us a favor? Could you please announce the arrival of Mashiach? Because that's what Malachi promised us. The great prophet said, before Mashiach comes, you've got to come. So look, we're enjoying ourselves. We've got through the Avadim part, already celebrating the redemption. That's why he appears when he appears. Help us to get rid of the oiven, those who hate us. Take all the chema, put it on the bad people, get rid of them and bring Mashiach and let this be the final redemption. So we go from the first ever redemption and we try to entice Eliyahu Navi with the final redemption at the end of days. You know, something interesting. If you look at the name Eliyahu, it's usually spelt with a vav at the end. Eliyah, who? There are five times in Tanakh where his name is spelt what's called chaser, lacking. Lacking what? The vav. And actually, this final prophecy of the final prophet, prophet Malachi, actually doesn't spell his name Eliyahu. It spells it Eliyah with the vav missing. Where's the Vav? What happened to it? Well, it happens to be that someone took it. Does anyone know who took the Vav of Eliyahu? Yaakov. There are five extra pieces of matzah for the young man over there. Very good. There are five times that Yaakov, Jacob, Yaakov, remember him? His name is spelt Male. Male means full, with an extra letter. And that letter is the Vav. Usually it's spelled Yud, Ayin, Kuf, Vet. But on five occasions, an extra boop, Vav is put there. It doesn't change the pronunciation, but it definitely changes the, the look and the word. Say the rabbi something unbelievable. You know what happened? Yaakov took the five vavs from Eliyahu. Why would he do that? Five of them? I hear one or two. What is this, Costco? Gonna get five for the price of three? What's going on over here? What's happening? Let me share something unbelievable with you. Yaakov Avinu was taking those five vavs as a guarantee. And the Maral and Rabbis tell us that the letter Vav looks like a finger. How many fingers do we have? Five. Five. What Yaakov was actually doing was making Eliyahu Hanavi 
give him the five fingers and shake his hand. Why would you shake a hand? To make a promise. What promise did Yaakov make Eliyahu give him? That one day his descendants, and this is exclusively Yaakov's descendants, that's why this handshake, actually the longest handshake in world history, if you think about it, couldn't go to Abraham because not all descendants became the Jewish people and not Yitzchak because not all his descendants became the Jewish people it had to be Yaakov because all of Yaakov's descendants became the Jewish people and so he took his hand and he stretched it out into history and he grabbed Eli and he took away his five fingers his hand and said you're making me a deal here right maybe it was like this maybe it was like this I don't know how they shook hands in those days but he shook his hand and said do me a favor promise me that you will one day redeem my people, my descendants, your people, from the galut, from the exile they're in. Because they're going to be spread out over the four corners of the earth. But you only have that ability. You have the ability to make a sound. You have the ability to shout out. And that one shout is going to pull from all four corners of the earth our people back to the land of Israel and to herald the coming of Mashiach. And that is why, my friends, the Afikomen, they we eat at the end of the Seder. So we start with Karpas. That's the first thing we put in our mouths. And we end with Afikomen which comes as a replacement for the Korban Pesach, the Paschal Lamb, that we cannot bring because we don't have a Beit HaMikdash. But that Afikomen is the biggest piece of Matzah. Because when you break that middle Matzah, the biggest piece is left for the end. Because the greatest redemption, my friends, I mean, you think Pesach is a good story? You think the Haggadah is a story of miracles it hasn't got anything on the final redemption my friends that we're going to see very soon that is going to eclipse the Pesach Seder so much so that we're not even going to need a Pesach Seder anymore because we're going to have a new Seder a new redemption by the way even the word Seder what a strange word the word Seder means order order like a sidor are the order of prayers and we eat the Pesach Seder that's the order of the 15 steps that we are going to take at the Pesach Seder but if you look at the story it doesn't make any sense it's all miracles it's actually an upturning of the order ah that my friends is the Jewish tradition for us the order of, of events is miraculous that is our order and what started with redemption from Mitzrayim God willing is going to end with the redemption of Mashiach friends we're so close to appreciate this evening with our friends our family with our children is the greatest level of appreciation that we today can give as Jews in 5782 May this be the final Pesach Seder. And may we soon experience the ultimate Seder upturning of miracles for our people, a Geula Shlema, that we all be able to celebrate together in Eretz Yisrael, in Yerushalayim, with the Beit HaMikdash, Bimhera, V'yamenu, Chag Kashev Sumech, Amen.